fried foods should not be heavy, nor should they be greasy. The first thing I'd like to show you how to fry is potatoes, French fries, which should be crispy on the outside and slightly soft on the inside. What you need for fried potatoes, good dry potato. A russet is really amazingly good, as is an Idaho. And you'll need a mandolin like this or a good sharp knife like this to cut the potatoes into the long rectangular shapes that are typically called French fries. You'll need a heavy bottomed pan. Cast iron with enamel is very good. You'll need a thermometer and either a strainer or a little spider basket like this. And uh, oh, one more thing, a potato peeler. I'll show you how. First thing to do is peel the potatoes, and we've peeled quite a few. Then you'll cut off one side of the potato, just want to flatten it a little bit. And then, using a mandolin, it's fitted with the French fry blade. These blades are a little bit more than a quarter of an inch apart. And use a guard to hold your potato or a cloth. I'm using a cloth because sometimes the guards, which have these little points that hold the potato and make marks in the potato. I don't, I don't like those marks. So I am using a cloth and press down firmly. And you have really gorgeous French fries. Here's the French fries that we have cut. So easy, easier than a knife. Look how beautiful. Put them immediately into ice water because soaking the potatoes really, really well will remove the starch, and refrigerating them will actually make the final product crispier. Invest in a mandolin of this size if you're gonna be making a lot of French fries. You can use a smaller mandolin like this for other kinds of potatoes. Different cuts of potato will have different results. Uh, thinner cuts will be crisp throughout, while fatter or bigger cuts will yield a crisp exterior with a very creamy interior. Now, by adjusting the blades on the big mandolin, you can make gaufrette, which are waffle fries. I love these. And it takes a little bit of practice before you become proficient, but make a straight cut on a large potato like this, and I'll do it without the towel so you can see clearly. Go this way, and then turn this way. 90 degrees, 90 degrees and you are left with little waffles. I love how these look. Put them in the water bath. Another really cute thing to cut are matchsticks like this. I love these. These are also called straw potatoes, and those should be rinsed after cutting so that they don't clump together as they cook, but keep them in cold water. And now to make the shoestring or the matchstick, Use the straight side of a long potato. And for this, you need a little bit of strength and push right through. And you have the long matchsticks. I love this too. See how much easier? You used to have to cut this all with a knife. Let these stay in water to four hours to overnight and then take them out of the water, put them in fresh water clean water before uh, drying them for frying. These are just plain potato chips. These are cottage fries, which are the long potatoes cut into wedges. And that's very, very nice. Those are steak or cottage fries, very dense and very nice. These can also, and rather than frying, you can oven roast these. So now let's get to the French fries themselves. We're going to cook them twice. Uh, in a deep fryer or in a pot on top of the stove, heat oil till it's 300 degrees. I like using these big enamel cast iron. They are very good for frying. Now this one should be 300 degrees. The potatoes themselves must be very well dried. Anytime you're frying, fry food that is dry. I love doing them on these wonderful cotton flour sack towels that we have. I just love these. Let them dry very, very well. And now these are ready. So get those right into the 300 degree oil. Don't crowd the pot. When you add this much potato to the oil, or if you add it at all, you might 
cause it to bubble over, be very careful. All of frying is cautionary. You see how it's starting to bubble up? If I put too many in, we might have an eruption of oil and it'll get all over your stove and you will be so mad at yourself. It happened to me once and only once because cleanup is hideous. So it is now um, a little less than 300, so raise the heat. Make sure you get right back up there. Raise that temperature to 300. And this is called blanching. It's only for three minutes in 300 degree oil. After three minutes, remove the blanched potatoes to a paper lined cookie sheet. Now I'm using a neutral oil, one that has a very high smoking point, soybean oil. You can use canola oil, uh, oils that have the high smoking point and don't have too much flavor to impart to the fried food. Now I'm adjusting the heat. I have it on high now to bring it back up to 300 degrees. It does cool off. Now you can tell if they're blanched all right if you break it. Oh yes. And it's soft on the inside, a little bit cooked on the outside. That is great. It should be almost cooked through but not brown. My other pot of oil is ready to take these potatoes and put them in very carefully. You can put the blanched potatoes into the oil with the spider. And oil is at 360 degrees. It can be between 350, 360. And they're frying nicely. Look at the color these are getting. Oh, so nice. Very happy with these. Now the correct kind of thermometer to use is one of these uh, that hangs on the side of the pot and make sure it's accurate. You can sometimes knock it and break it, so just be careful and make sure that it is uh, in good working order before you start frying. And here, drain them well on paper toweling. They're looking nice and crispy. Now, while they're hot, salt them with kosher salt. I think it's important to put the salt on. And, mmm. So good. So very, very good. Now the gaufrette are cooking beautifully, 300 degrees. They do not have to be blanched. They're so thin and delicate. Look, look at these little waffle potatoes. I adore these. And they are so beautiful as an hors d'oeuvre. You can put a little bit of sour cream and caviar on them. Don't forget to salt them, very important. Just like the french fries, salt these gaufrette. Really improves the flavor. These gaufrette are perfect. They are golden brown, they are uniformly colored, and they are crispy, salty, and delicious. Better than anything you can buy. And in front here, these are the steak fries. Oh, so great alongside a roasted steak or a barbecued steak. These are shoestring potatoes. Crunchy and very good. Your own homemade potato chips, french fries, and more gaufrette. Serve these to your family, not all the time, but some of the time for a special occasion. They will adore. Fried chicken should be crisp on the outside and moist on the inside. And it can be made easily at home if you have the right tools. Cast iron skillet, a frying thermometer, a pair of tongs, a meat thermometer, instant read, very, very essential, and some buttermilk, flour, cornmeal, and some spices. I'll show you how to make the best fried chicken right in your own kitchen. Once a year, I have a fried chicken dinner at my house, and I do the chicken in batches. Uh, all the chicken, and these are small chickens called fryers, two and a half to three pounds each, are cut up into um, eight or 10 pieces each. And I soak them in ice water overnight in the refrigerator. And then I make the buttermilk marinade. And the chickens have to stay in the buttermilk for four hours minimum in the refrigerator. Buttermilk lends a subtle tanginess to the chicken because it contains lactic acid, 
and it also has a uh, nice tenderizing effect on proteins. It also helps the chicken remain moist and juicy. So this is one chicken cut up. It's been soaked in salted ice water. And add to that four cups of buttermilk. You can also take good organic whole milk and add to one quart, you can add about three tablespoons of cider vinegar. Uh, wait for a little while and you have something resembling buttermilk. Two tablespoons of salt, one teaspoon of black pepper, and one and a half tablespoons of dry mustard as a good sharpness to the mix, and one teaspoon of cayenne. Kind of wonderful ingredient. And just mix this all up. The chicken's gonna stay in here, as I said, four hours or up to overnight. Cover with a bit of plastic wrap and put into the refrigerator. So now one hour in advance of frying, remove the chicken from the marinade onto a rack. Let the chicken dry on the rack for one hour. Now this has been dried, you can see it's still tacky, but much drier than this chicken. And now for the dry coating. One and a half cups of all-purpose flour. And I'm just using a bag, this is so easy. And th two or three tablespoons of yellow cornmeal. Cayenne pepper, oh like half a teaspoon and one teaspoon of black pepper. This is very similar to what my friends down in Amarillo, Texas coated their chicken with, and one teaspoon of salt. Shake this up, and now drop the chicken in. So put three or four pieces of chicken in the bag, and shake. Nicely coated. And when I was making fried chicken for great big crowds, I would do lots and lots of chickens. And you see how nicely the flour is adhering? Putting the pieces into the flour is called dredging. So even though the flour is sticking, the chicken's not wet. Now there's plenty of flour in here that can be used to coat that other chicken, but it has to dry for one hour. Set that aside and we're ready to fry. If the oil is the right temperature, don't fry. if. A cube of bread doesn't turn golden brown in a minute or less. But my thermometer is telling me at 330 degrees that it's not quite ready. 340, oh, we're getting ready. So put the dark meat in first. Wear covered shoes and an apron. Now, just take your thermometer out of the oil and cover this for four minutes on each side and really pay attention to the timing. Uh, this method of frying is called shallow frying. The best pan is this cast iron skillet with the cover. I love this pan and it really does conduct the heat very, very nicely and it holds the heat more effectively than other types of skillets. At tag sales, you can find these pans with the covers, and that's the best cast iron because it is uh, already aged and uh, has a beautiful patina. Oh, it looks so good. Looking good. Now here's some things to keep in mind when frying. If the oil is not hot enough, the food will absorb too much of the fat. But if the oil is too hot, the surface of the food will burn before it cooks on the inside. So keep the temperature pretty constant. Keep extra vegetable oil at room temperature nearby 
And if the oil in the pot gets too hot, you can cool it down by adding some of this room temperature oil. Not cold oil, but room temperature. And the chicken pieces in the pan should not be touching. Thighs and legs should register 165 degrees, and white meat, the breast meat, uh, should register 160 in the thickest part. Well, the first chicken's all done, and now I've started frying the second. It certainly looks delicious. Fried chicken. One of the most essential steps in making successful tempura is cutting the vegetables correctly. This is a sweet potato, peeled and cut into quarter inch slices. I love sweet potato tempura. I also love broccoli, snow peas, Japanese eggplant. This is the kind of eggplant to get for tempura. It doesn't have a lot of acid and it is very tasty, coated in batter and fried. Mushrooms are also delicious. These are oyster mushrooms, which make nice tempura. And the shishito peppers are also very delicious as tempura. Uh, some hot, some not so hot. And these little woodland mushrooms, well, if you can find them, are also nice and made into tempura in little clusters. So our vegetables are ready. And we can put those right here until we mix our batter. The batter consists of one large egg yolk. And save your egg whites. I just collect them in plastic containers. One egg yolk. And I'm starting with three quarters of a cup of iced, sparkling mineral water. I find that the sparkling part of it makes the batter light and thready. So mix your egg yolk right into the water. See how nice and fluffy it is? Some tempura chefs use beer, some use water, some use plain cold water, but make sure it is icy. And then one cup of cake flour and pass it through a sieve over the top of the liquid just to get out any unwanted lumps. And mix this just lightly. You don't have to worry about mixing in all the flour. Little bits of dry flour are okay. The oil is at the right temperature. Now put a little bit of flour in a shallow dish and roll some vegetables in the flour. This will help the batter adhere a little better. Now, this is the shishito pepper, and you can drop this right into the oil. Oh, cooking very well. I first started getting interested in tempura when I visited the great Ten Masa, the very, very elegant tempura chef in Tokyo. But he was one of the only chefs ever invited into the Imperial Palace to cook for the emperor. And I loved Ten Masa, Ten Masa-san. So you see how nice these are cooking. Use your metal chopsticks to turn the peppers over. Oh, these are gorgeous. They should get just a tiny bit of color on them. And they do roll around. So these are already done. Tempura really cooks quickly. Now, I'm just going to dry these a little bit on a rack, but Tenmasa-san would put this right on a plate with a little bit of blotting paper underneath and not a drop of oil would be on his tempura. I don't know how he did it, but he did. So keep the oil constant. Eggplant, another very lovely way to create a vegetable tempura. Use your wooden chopsticks. Don't dip these wooden chopsticks into the hot oil. But just gently drop the eggplant slice in. And keep these separate if you can. And into this pot, I can cook something else. One of my favorites, as I said, was sweet potato tempura. And this, in Japan, is served with a sprinkling of granulated sugar. 
I love sweet potato like that. And it's served as part of the meal, but toward the end of the meal. And these are doing very nicely. Now, tempura should be served with a dashi and um, radish dipping sauce, or we have a, another wonderful sauce made out of soy and uh, sesame oil uh, that is also very delicious. Do a couple of these beautiful mushrooms. Uh, these look very good. Broccoli is another wonderful thing to make into tempura. All the little pieces of broccoli really pick up the batter. Impeccable oil, the right temperature, the right batter, and you will have Great tempura. Uh, what fun. Oh, let's do a few snow peas. They're very pretty. A tempura doesn't have to be just vegetables, of course. It can be shrimp and other seafood. Eel tempura is very delicious. And here we have very nice peas that are tender and with a crunchy exterior, very pretty on a plate. Well, I think I have enough tempura just to show you a nice presentation. I have a little absorbent piece of paper. You can use watercolor paper. Uh, there's special tempura paper that you can find uh, to line your plate. Put your vegetables in a pleasant arrangement on the paper, grouping one kind of vegetable, and this will serve one person or several, depending on whether it's an hors d'oeuvre or a first course. Mmm, this looks so good. Oh, the mushrooms look especially enticing. And some eggplant. I like the eggplant because we left the skin on, and it looks very pretty like this. And there is the lovely sauce with dashi and soy and daikon radish finely grated, which is the typical tempura dip. So here is vegetable tempura for one with dipping sauce and Japanese chopsticks. And here is dessert. Oh, by the way, always serve an odd number of something. This is seven. And mound the top of these sweet potato tempuras with a sprinkling, a generous sprinkling, of granulated sugar. I think you'll really like the taste. So here we have vegetable tempura. If you stick to the rules of frying, you can make the perfect French fries, the most delicious fried buttermilk chicken, and even light and fluffy tempura.